Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Howl's Histories and it's going to be on the War of the Roses this week. Now when we think of this exciting time period we might think I suppose of the words of the Bishop of Carlisle from Shakespeare's play Richard II. Disorder, horror, fear and mutiny shall inhabit the land and be called the fields of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Or we might think of the words of Richmond from Richard III. England have long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly sheds the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughters his own son. The son compelled has been butchered to the sire. And yet, due to a shortage of labour and tenants, the standard of living for the ordinary person in England was, was actually very high, uh, not to be exceeded until the 18th century, and visitors to England from Europe would remark on how well run England was during this time period. And so, if people could live happily, just what were the War of the Roses and what was it all about? Well, if we're to understand what's going on, we're going to have to go back quite a few reigns to the end of the reign of Richard II, the one who's perhaps known as the Boy King, and he reigns from 1377 to 1399, and he comes to the throne at the age of 10. Now, it's against the background of the Hundred Years' War, and it's going to be important that we, we think about what's at stake with the Hundred Years' War. It's a conflict between the crowns of England and France. The, as we discussed in a previous uh, Howe's history, the, the royal family of England consider themselves to be the rightful rulers of France. And in this, they are largely right. But the, the French had claimed that they were the Salic lands, despite the fact that the Salic lands are to the east of France. And Salic, if they were the Salic lands, that means that Salic law takes place in France. And the, the claim that the English monarchy should be the rightful kings of France is because they are descended from a woman in the French royal family. And they claim their descent and their claim to the throne through this woman. But Salic law says you can't claim descent through what the line of the female. You can only claim it from father to son. And so the French, to try and keep the English royal family out of uh, of rule in France, they claim to be the Salic lands and claim to, to impose Salic law. Now, Richard II, the boy king, he is the son of the Black Prince of Wales, grandson to the great warrior king, King Edward III, the one who had won the famous victories against the French despite being heavily outnumbered at the battles of Cressy and Poitiers. And so Edward III and his son, the Black Prince, they are England's great warlords. Uh, these two are, are legends of renown. The, uh, the king, I suppose in many ways, was captain of the aristocracy like a captain of a rugby team he got on well with the england's aristocracy he was used to the rough and tumble of warlike men they res the knights and the great and the good of this country respected edward the third and the black prince of wales because they were they were men's men they were great warriors they were great leaders they were renowned throughout europe as fearsome leaders in war they were the kind of men you could follow, you could follow and you could win, and you could come home safely and rich. But Richard II, because of course Edward III dies, and the Black Prince had died before his father had died very young indeed. A tragedy for England, and of course a tragedy for his father Edward III, but he had left behind his son Richard II, or at least the man who would become Richard II, his son Richard. Now, Richard is going to be a very different kind of king. He's not one of these rough-and-tumble soldiers and warlords. He's a very religious man, very pious. Uh, he sees himself very much as a, a messiah-like figure to save the rough-and-ready English. 
Now, in 1381, there was the Peasants' Revolt. Now, it has to be said, as has been said many times famously, uh, the Peasants' Revolt is mostly remarkable for having very few peasants in it. Now, I know that sounds odd, but let's think about the England that we are studying. Well, it's after the Black Death that has cut a scythe through England's population. And so the great and the good, the lords, have now found that there was a shortage of people. Now, previously, you could treat the peasants like rubbish, because, you know, there were just always more peasants. You could say, right, you will work for me for free, as it is our feudal rights. You will work for me for three days without pay, but in return, I'll let you have that bit of land. Well, now there's a load of land that doesn't need to be used. And so they, the peasants start to get into a bit of a bidding war. One knight says, right, you'll have to do three days' worth of, uh, of unpaid work. Another lord goes, whoa, 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 if you come and live on my land, I'll give you land for two days. He goes, whoa, oh, no, come, come work for me, I'll give you land for one day. You can see how very quickly the peasants realise that they've actually got, they've actually got, as it were, the whip hand when it comes to financial uh, negotiations. There is a labour shortage in England at this time. And so there's actually been the growth of a, a middle class. And it's that, that rural middle class that will take part in the Peasants' Revolt. People who have gained from the Black Death, because a lot of people have died and they've inherited plots, and they've been able to negotiate better pay. They're reasonably well educated. They know their rights and... Uh, so well, such as they are in this time period, they know their opportunities more importantly, and they're determined to not lose what they've gained through heavy taxation and through the imposition of a new feudal system. And so in, in 1376, the Black Prince of Wales had died. In 1377, Edward III had died, and Richard had come to the throne. And in 1381, there's the Peasants' Revolt, as his government are trying to extract money from the peasants and the middle classes don't want to hand over their money without having some guarantee of rights. A Magna Carta for the people so that they can't have their money taken off them. Now, when this peasants' revolt breaks out across the southern shires of England, then the English aristocracy panic, but Richard II keeps cool. And famously, when the, the rebels are there to meet with him, and when their leader, Wat Tyler, is murdered in front of the peasants, Richard II rides to the peasants and says, you will have no leader but me. Clever words, because the peasants think, great, the king's on our side, he's going to lead us against the English aristocracy and look after our rights, whereas, of course, it also means that they're going to have to do what they're told, and they have to be told what to do by the king remarkable calm and courage from what is at that stage only a 14 year old boy but because he manages to keep calm and he manages to face this incredible threat to the royal family's authority in England after this point Richard II crucially is going to decide that he knows best because the adults around him had panicked they had told him to run away from the peasants which would probably have led to the mob killing him quite frankly but he, however, kept calm. And now, ever since, he's there thinking, well, why should I listen to your advice? After all, I was the one that was proven right. I was the only one who knew what was for the best. From now on, it's me that we're going to be listening to. And so this is going to be a really bad lesson that he learns from the peasants' revolt. And this is what's going to cause the trouble as we go forward and start to approach the War of the Roses.